Thank you all for being here. Good afternoon for the preliminary budget hearing. Good afternoon. I'm Council Member Carlina Rivera, Chair of the City Council's Committee on Hospitals. And during today's hearing, we will review New York Health and Hospitals' $7.4 billion fiscal 2019 operating budget, as well as new expense funding for correctional health services and performance indicators from the fiscal 2018 preliminary mayor's management report. Although the City Council is conducting budget hearings on the fiscal 2019 preliminary budget, today's hearing will address H&H's budget as of the fiscal 2018 executive budget. The Council made multiple requests to the New York City Office of Management and Budget for an updated plan, but the agency would only provide a budget that is nearly a year out of date. This failure to share basic information undermines the Council's ability to execute its charter mandated role. The City Charter grants the City Council the responsibility for oversight and investigation of the property affairs in government of the City. As the City's public hospital system, H&H constitutes an integral component of the City's government and the general welfare of its residents. In order to analyze H&H's fiscal health and to ensure transparency and accountability in our municipal hospital system, the Council requires complete, accurate, and timely financial information, particularly given the City's substantial investments in H&H, which will exceed $1 billion this fiscal year. I look forward to receiving H&H's fiscal 2019 executive budget well in advance of the committee's fiscal 2019 executive budget hearing. Specifically, I look forward to reviewing the fiscal implications of the seven actions you outlined during last month's oversight hearing on H&H's transformation plan, One New York Healthcare for Our Neighborhoods. I'm particularly interested in reviewing your plans to generate revenue through improved billing and hiring practices and to reduce expenses through targeted personnel restructuring. Ensuring the financial health of our municipal hospital system proves vital to achieving our shared vision of a healthy and equitable city. We know that safety net hospitals serve a crucial role in caring for our city's most vulnerable and marginalized citizens, including undocumented immigrants, low-income children, and people with mental illness and substance abuse issues. Recent actions by Congress, including the extension of funding for the Children's Health Insurance Program and the delay of any cuts to the disproportionate share hospital payments have provided some near fiscal relief to safety net hospitals, including H&H. However, other critical aspects of our country's health care system, including the Affordable Care Act, Medicaid, and Medicare remain at risk. And we know significant work remains to mitigate the billion dollar deficits facing H&H. We have a unique opportunity to capitalize on this period of transition in our country's health care system. As you know, health professionals are increasingly providing care outside of traditional inpatient facilities with urgent care sites and health technology serving patients in new ways. H&H must adapt to this landscape while also strengthening the health care facilities that serve as the bedrocks of their communities. H&H's $3 billion capital plan will prove vital in these efforts, from implementing a state-of-the-art electronic record, medical record system to purchasing essential medical equipment and renovating old buildings and structures. I would like to thank my committee staff, finance analyst Jeanette Merrill, policy analyst Crystal Pond, and committee counsel Zay Emanuel. You will now be sworn in. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Let's begin. Red, there. red is good, yeah. Okay, very good. Um, Members of the committee, I'm so happy to be here. I'm Dr. Mitch Katz. I'm the President and Chief Executive Officer of New York City Health and Hospitals. I really appreciated the dialogue that we had two weeks ago. Uh, I feel incredibly supported uh, by the Council, by the other parts of the New York City family Boobies. to Boobies. really make health and hospitals realize all of its potential. 
it's an amazing organization. Uh, I'm so pleased when I go around to the different hospitals and clinics and meet the doctors and nurses and other professionals caring for people. It's an amazing set of people who are working under extremely difficult conditions, um, but with the focus of taking excellent care of our patients. And I'm absolutely committed uh, to making the system at Health and Hospitals as good as the people in it. Um, Part of that is to make us fiscally solvent. Uh, I have never actually run an organization uh, that maintained a deficit. I have started with organizations with deficits, but it's very unhealthy for an organization to not have a clear path to fiscal solvency. We all have to agree on what the subsidy that uh, health and hospitals will need in order to care for its uh, uninsured patients, but that has to be predictable and reasonable, and it can't be middle of the year, we need extra dollars. That's not, that's not sensible, that's not how I plan on going forward. I've only been here uh, just a little under three months. I feel like I have a much better sense now than I did two months ago, and I feel absolutely certain uh, that together uh, we can make this happen. Uh, for this year, and I very much take chairperson's uh, comment that ideally I would be here with a three-year forecast and all of the information and I have made it clear to all that that is the appropriate expectation and we will get there. I'm happy to say that at least for this year we have met the target of 1.2 billion that through reducing costs by 387 million and increasing revenue by 820 we have met it. We will meet it. The major issues are going forward, the out years. Um, to this year's uh, decreased costs were by improving supply chain, using attrition, a major elimination of consultants, and just last uh, Friday we decreased administrative staff at central office only, not at the facilities, not at the hospitals or clinics. Uh, by 35 positions for an annualized savings of $5 million. Uh, on the revenue side, we're improving billing, uh, we're increasing revenue from our health plan, we're expanding value-based payments, increasing DISRIP funding, uh, enhancing our uh, care restructuring program, there's an increase to federally qualified health centers, and of course, and I'm very grateful to the council and to all the others who worked to help push off the two-year dish cut. That would have been disastrous at this point. As I'll talk later, although the ultimate cut still happens and actually would be even more dramatic, I'm grateful because I feel together this gives us a ramp, right? This gives us the time, part of the challenge on the, the seven-point plan that you referred to, uh, Chairperson, is that it's not something I can do by memo, uh, not something that is as simple as say, okay, now we're going to bill, right? As the, it requires everything from when the person comes in to, to the clinic or hospital. Are they appropriately registered? Do we have their insurance information? Do we call for prior authorizations? Uh, for their services. Uh, when they're seen, do we code for those services appropriately? Uh, do we send the bill? Do we send the bill to the right place? When the bill is sent, is the correct code on that bill? So even if you've coded it correctly, if the code is not on the bill, you won't get paid. After you've sent the correct bill, sometimes insurance companies, being insurance companies, still don't pay. You have to appeal. They, several of them simply deny paying. Um, and uh, that's unacceptable if the contract says, but you have to appeal. So each of those steps requires work at health and hospitals. But if we follow through on all of those steps, uh, you will find that health and hospitals will not have to shrink. Health and hospitals will be able to grow. Health and hospitals will be able to improve staffing at all our facilities. So uh, just for review, we're going to reduce administrative expenses. We're going to bill uh, people with insurance. We're going to code appropriately. We're going to stop sending paying patients away. 
We're going to hire the positions that are necessary to generate revenue. We're going to start providing those services that are well reimbursed. Uh, and very importantly, we're going to convert the uninsured to people who have insurance. And I think we spoke a little bit about this. The city has had successful efforts to enroll people into Medicaid. The real uh, opportunity is people who are just above the Medicaid line. Remember that Medicaid is available if you're up to 139% of poverty. But many still being at 200% poverty is still to be very low income in New York City. Um, people at that level struggle, they come to us. Uh, we need to get those people onto the basic health plan or get them insurance from the exchange. To the extent that we simply keep providing them sliding scale services, we are undermining the ACA. We are not bringing in um, the hundred, literally hundreds of millions of dollars that are available to uh, health and hospitals. And we're, we're part of them not getting all the benefits that they can get. When they get the exchange, it's not just that they, it's the same $10 copay, but it's all the other benefits that they are going to get by virtue of being insured. So I think that's a huge opportunity uh, for the city. And the good thing is um, we know who those people are. They're already coming to us. Um, so it's simply a matter of having the right people available um, so that we are able to make those connections. Equally important is expanding our primary care footprint. Even within our own health plan, our fully owned health plan, the majority of patients are assigned to a primary care doctor outside of health and hospitals. Why is that? Is that because that's what the people are requesting? No, it's because we don't have appointments available. If we don't have appointments available, then appropriately they're sent to other providers. Right? The patient's care should always come first. But often they're requesting one of our sites and we are full. Um, so I have, I have a, a new, very energetic Dr. Long, head of primary care. He knows he needs to hire 55 new providers. Uh, we are doing everything possible to hire those providers. We're going to have more creative models of using pharmacists, using registered nurses, um, so that we are providing a really great service. On the uh, physical uh, front, we are opening a new $28 million community health center on Staten Island. As soon as we receive New York State Department of Health approval. We will be opening uh, this spring. Uh, I'm very pleased about that. Uh, I was so happy to be with the chairperson at the Gouverneur to open up those beautiful beds. I know those were, those were long in coming uh, to the city, um, but I think that that is a really important area. Um, I know the chair and council member Margaret Chin worked really hard to make that happen and I appreciated that you were uh, at the opening event. Uh, we will continue to improve care uh, throughout uh, health and hospitals. Uh, using uh, the One City Health will continue to expand our population health care so that people both in our facilities and beyond our facilities are getting the care that you would want for your family, that I want for my family to be delivered uh, by health and hospitals. Um, we are uh, trying to be able to provide great care at all levels. Uh, last year, universal dis uh, depression screening for adults in primary care practice became standard practice at health and hospitals. We're screening all pregnant women and new mothers for maternal depression and linking them to care. We have behavioral health services at all of our five family justice centers, which provide a comprehensive range of services to survivors of domestic violence. I know this council has done some amazing work around opioid addiction. 
and trying to make sure that New Yorkers have the appropriate services, they don't lose their lives from this uh, awful epidemic. Uh, we have naloxone kits available to the community for free at New York City Health and Hospitals Lincoln, and we're going to expand this to all of our hospitals. I'm very pleased to hear that within our family center at Rikers, family members are actually taught that when someone leaves Rikers, they're at incredible risk for overdose because they may have once used and they didn't use while they were in jail. Now if they go back to using uh, at a dose similar to what they were using before jail, that's a time when they're at terrible risk uh, for overdose. And so we actually counsel the families. We give them Narcan. Uh, I think that it's an important part of the solution. Uh, we also know that one of the solutions is to uh, be able to have providers who are able to prescribe buprenorphine. We have increased the number of providers to 450. Um, through our efforts, the number of patients who receive medicated assisted treatment will increase to 2,000. Uh, 500 over the next three years. Our goal is ultimately that more than 5,000 New Yorkers gain access to medical assisted treatment. I want to mention a few highlights around capital projects thanks to this great council. Uh, council member Debbie Rose, a thank you for her contribution to our community health center on Staten Island. Uh, council member Eugene for his ongoing contributions to Kings County. Uh, we are renovating and expanding the adult emergency room at Elmhurst. Um, and we're appreciative to the Queens Borough President and the Queens City Delegation uh, for their support uh, for an issue that I know is, is close to your heart. Uh, Chairperson, uh, Roberto Clemente Clinic in Manhattan is getting a new renovation. Uh, which I know you have worked on and I appreciate, as well as the work of former council member Rosie Mendez and the Manhattan Borough President uh, for their support. Uh, having the appropriate equipment helps us a great deal and I know various members of the council have provided that for hospitals uh, in their area. Uh, we are hard at work at a new hospital tower in Coney Island which flooded in Hurricane Sandy. Uh, we're uh, working on our EPIC uh, rebuild uh, so that all of our facilities have the appropriate uh, computer technology. I'm going to close by just mentioning uh, correctional health. Uh, I want to say how happy I was uh, even from California when I heard that uh, New York City Health and Hospitals was taking over correctional health because as a public hospital person, uh, I believe strongly that this is work that should exist in the public sector, that uh, public hospital doctors are the right people to care for people who are in jail, uh, who are leaving jail, to arrange the kind of aftercare that's necessary. And now that I'm here, of course, I'm even happier that you made that decision a couple of years ago and made it happen. Uh, I'm fully committed to our uh, correctional health program. Uh, over the last uh, two years, we've operationalized the 24-hour, seven-day-a-week pre-arraignment screening unit in the Manhattan Detention Center. Uh, we've nearly tripled the number of patients receiving hepatitis C treatment. We've opened seven satellite clinics to bring the services closer to our patients. We've opened two new specialized housing units. We've tripled the number of daily patients on methadone maintenance and buprenorphine. Uh, we'll conduct a Queens pilot to streamline the conduct of court-ordered forensic psychiatric evaluations. We're working on enhancing mental health services for women in jail. I, I was very pleased to hear that 16 and 17-year-olds will not be at Rikers. I think that is the right decision. Uh, 16 and 17 year olds, in my opinion, do not belong in a place like Rikers. Uh, I'm absolutely committed to health and hospitals taking on that service. I think that one of the examples of tremendous synergy is that 
primary care in and of itself can reduce recidivism back to jail because primary care doctors, part of our work is always connecting people to existing services. So when somebody, when we see somebody, we're not just interested in their hypertension or their diabetes, we're interested in where are they living, how are they getting food, are they getting the benefits that they're entitled to. And so part of why I think this is such an important thing for correctional health to be in the public sector is because it makes it so much easier to make those connections. With that, I, I'm, I'm here uh, with my director of managed care, my, my CFO, um, and uh, our head of correctional health, um, and other staff members as well. We, we appreciate your support, we appreciate your questions, we appreciate um, your thoughts on how we transform this into a really successful, terrific system that people are proud to work in and get their care at. Thank you. Thank you, and of course I want to acknowledge council members Alan Maisel, council member uh, Dr. Matthew Eugene, and council member Reynoso, thank you for being here. So thank you Dr. Katz for your testimony. Um, you know, we're both on a similar timeline for uh, a new position. And I want to thank you for being here, I guess, two hearings in just a few weeks. So we're experiencing this together. You know, in this position, it, 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 my constituents and the people in the, of the city of New York, they require transparency and accountability. And I, we expect the same thing from our municipal hospital system. So we want to make sure that the council is receiving complete, accurate, and timely financial information. And I know I said this in, in, in my opening statement, but I really wanted to underline this because we have had some challenges in the past in really requesting and for your agency to deliver um, accurate and comprehensive reporting. So we hope that under your new leadership, we're going to have a better relationship in terms of communication and exchange of information. So with the, I guess you've pretty much laid out the plan, your seven point plan more or less. I want to ask whether you would commit to in the future putting a dollar amount to each of those. So whether it's administrative expenses, billing, coding, hiring, reimburse, the reimbursement of services that bring more money in and increasing enrollment. Um, really putting a monetary value on that so we can see it in terms of your financial projections where H&H &H is going to be. Absolutely. I, I think the, the only uh, thing I'll, I'll ask your indulgence is, is a few of them run together. So for example, how much money you get from your insurance billing depends on how successful you are getting people insurance and how good you are at coding. So I will probably lump a few, I, part of uh, why I've separated them and not just said, you know, we're going to increase, you know, insurance is that I'm aware that prior efforts sometimes have not worked. And so I don't want to be in a position of suggesting to people that I think it's just as easy as, oh, we're going to bring in a lot more privately insured people. So I've tried to separate it so that people can understand both why it takes some effort to do this. But uh, the decrease in administrative expenses, that's clearly separate. Um, so that, that one's easy to, to separate out. Um, I think the other, I may wind up with one figure that somewhat encompasses them because again, they're not exactly separable. A coding is not, if, you, if nobody is insured or fewer people are insured, coding doesn't help you. Uh, conversely, if you send a lot of bills but they're not appropriately coded, you don't get any money. So if that's an acceptable, friendly amendment, I absolutely believe that the council should see all of the figures. There's, there's certainly, and again, I, I want to apologize, this is not, uh, I'm still learning New York City, um, and I'm still learning how things are done here. Um, there is no information that I have that I wouldn't at this moment share with you. Um, Obviously, the, what, we were just at our own uh, finance committee meeting yesterday at the board. All of, I feel like the transparency is actually good on where we are now. Where I think we're all sort of trying to figure out is, okay, but you don't run a system based on where you are now. 
You run a system based on where are you over the next at least three years, I think of as standard, right? As I think because you start getting more than three years, it does get very hard to project out since so much depends on political. So the, the place where we're not where I would like to be is I would like to be with you in saying, okay, so I've solved this year, or we've solved this year, but here's where we are at the end of next year, the end of the year after, and the end of the year after. And I, I am in no means holding that information from you. I don't have that information at the moment. I'm absolutely committed to working with, with the council, working with my staff, working with OMB and the mayor's office, and being able to bring you projections that are meaningful. So you can, I guess, confirm that this plan, the One New York plan, is going to change. And w with everything that you're, you're considering, all of the factors, the projections, the political climate, et cetera, this plan will change. And, and for example, you mentioned um, a big amount earlier. So there's a $483 million in projected revenue from Medicare waivers. That's one of, the, one of several aspects of the plan. And that proves unrealistic in this climate. Correct? So when do you think the council can expect an updated plan, considering that certain things are right. intertwined and dependent on the other, and including revenue savings from all the new initiatives that you mentioned? Right. I'm thinking two months, two to yeah. three months. <laughs> right. So for the May, the May hearing, just want to get, just want to have something to look forward to. Okay, great. So in addition to the Medicaid waiver, so what other part of the, what other parts of the plan require revision? For example, fiscal 2019 projections include 369 million in revenue from federal and state charity care and 285 million revenue from health insurance initiatives. Are these numbers still accurate? Those, oh, go ahead. Um, Introduce yourself. Hi, I'm P.V. Anantram, CFO for Health and Hospitals. Um, the $369 million that uh, you note here are through waivers that we expected to get from the federal government. We clearly are not in a position to attain that today. So we will be retooling against the seven-point plan that, that Dr. Katz just mentioned. Uh, the only other piece that is not appropriate in this plan is the increase in headcount reductions that move from $250 million to 448. Um, I think Dr. Katz has already said that, that um, we are at a place today that we should be looking to add more clinical staff, and so we would have to retool on that. However, administrative expenditures are still a big part of our reduction plan. Right. I, I think this best relates, you know, there are two narratives that are possible. There's the shrink out of the budget problem, and there's the grow out of the budget problem. And part of why I don't personally think that the shrink is likely to be effective is as you, two, there are two problematic parts of shrink. One is as you lose staff, you lose revenue. Um, so the, if you don't, and if you, especially one of the challenges of attrition is you don't necessarily shrink equally. So you could actually be in a position where you lose certain members of the care team and can no longer provide the service, therefore you no longer get the revenue, but you still have some members of the care team. And so you have the expense, now you have none of the revenue, now you're worse off um, than you were before. So I, I think that that's one part of, of why, you know, shrinking um, does, not, does not work very well always. Um, the second reason is I think there is a huge amount of potential at health and hospitals um, and that we would do better rather than saying to people there are going to be fewer and fewer staff which then puts at risk safety and reputation saying you know let's grow the things we're really good at. Uh, it may not be growing everything and I think people understand that, that that's true whether you're health and hospitals or you're Presby or any other group. No one you in general you can't succeed in every market, in every service. But there are a lot of things health and hospitals does super well. And we should do more of those things. Um, that may mean that people have to do different jobs, um, that we need people to move from one thing to another. But I don't think that shrinking is going to be the most successful method of getting us out of our current problem. And that's why I, I've asked that, that we revise looking at that number and instead focus on 
where are the areas where additional staff actually bring revenue in excess of their cost, right? That's what you want. You want, you want to look at those areas where if you hire, you know, people, uh, for example, a, a productive primary care doctor can often bring two to three times the salary of a primary care doctor to your overall system, right? Because it's the lives that, that come in, it's not the visit, it's the, the fact that then people need additional tests, um, those tests get billed, um, they, the people then need hospitalization, so the, there, there, is, there is a path here. Ask you about utilization, um, because of course that has a lot to do with who's coming into the hospital. We talked a lot in the last hearing about underinsured and uninsured patients and making sure that we are serving them. So in the first four months of, of fiscal year 2018, H&H &H provided healthcare services to about 632,000 unique patients, which is actually a 2% decrease when compared to the same period of the previous year. However, you, your report says that the downward trend may be flattening. So what, what data informs H&H's assertion that the downward trend may be flattening and given the need to increase the patient population in order to increase our revenue, why doesn't the report include targets for the number of unique patients served? And what are your goals? Well, th that's and I'll great. ask you about Metro Plus as well because I know you had a, a million uh, target for enrollment that I believe you scaled back and I'll ask you about that as well. So right now, um, utilization is decreasing, not because people don't want our services, but because we're full. We tell people, you call, we say we don't have an appointment, because we don't. Um, and I think that um, we, if we're going to be able to grow, then we have to be able to have appointments for people who need to come forward for services. Um, I think uh, the Part of, and, and I want to make sure that, that I, I, I get it right, um, I su fully support the, u the use that occurred around attrition. You had a major, health and hospitals had a major financial problem, had a need in the least disruptive way to decrease the size of its budget. The problem is that you can only use attrition so far. And then at a certain point, it ceases to be a useful, broad technique. Because now you're, in, you're, you're affecting your ability to see new people. And that is the, the point that I think we've reached. And so uh, the strategic use of attrition is, uh, so one of my first things on attrition is stop holding nurse positions when a nurse announces that he or she is retiring. There's no, there's no savings in that. What actually happens is that you have to use registry or overtime or some other form. And in fact, all of those nurse positions did ultimately get approved in the review process. So it wasn't that anyone was ever saying no, but if you, in bureaucracies, if you set up a process, you create a delay. So some a nurse would announce that he or she was leaving and then that unit would send a request to the facility and the facility would review all of their positions and they would agree the nurse was needed and then they would send that position to central office and then central office would review it and they'd say that that position is needed and then you would get an agreement to hire. Well, that's all great, but now three months have gone by. And meanwhile, the nurse is not there. I also discovered um, that uh, through a problem in communication, we were holding grant-funded positions. Well, that's not useful to anyone, right? You get a grant, s having no one in that position does not save anybody any money. So I think what the place I want to be in is to acknowledge the value that attrition played and now say we need a more strategic, thoughtful point now because we achieved the easy part of the, the attrition. Now it will only work, you know, in a, in a, if used in a more strategic way. So you mentioned the, some of the hospitals are full and you can't get an appointment. And at the last hearing you mentioned how you're really looking into the scheduling system and it does need an overhaul. It's not centralized. And in fact, the e-record implementation 
um, you know, sake of a, a pun here, was kind of an epic failure. Um, I know that you are moving, you're trying to move this along, you've cut the consultants, some of the people that have really delayed this process in all honesty because of inefficiency and incompetency, but is every hospital full? I mean, aren't there some hospitals who do have appointments available who can serve patients with the best quality care? And what are you doing to address each hospital individually? Well, thanks. So, so the place where the delay is either in the case of primary care or in the case of specialty care. And it exists in both the hospitals and in our community clinics and federally qualified health centers. Uh, we, we do have the ability for hospital beds, although there are exceptions. Uh, so in a very positive thing that happened two weeks ago, uh, we had two rehab units uh, that were half full, one at Queens, one at Elmhurst. Elmhurst has had a major shortage of medical surgical beds resulting in backups to the emergency department. Uh, with cooperation of labor and the people involved, we moved the rehab from Queens to Elmhurst. So now we have one full unit at Elmhurst. And now we're uh, negotiating with New York State Department of Health to turn that rehab unit into med surge beds. But in general, that's an exception. In general, we're good on med surge beds. It's the, it's the outpatient appointments. You're absolutely right um, that the system is heterogeneous. There are, if, if somebody wanted an appointment at Renaissance as a new patient appointment in the next week or two, that's entirely doable. Um, and I, I commend Renaissance, who just did a really positive uh, redesign to shorten the time it takes for a patient to be seen. Um, they, they're to be commended for that. If you wanted a primary care appointment at Bellevue, where you were both born and served as the community advisory board, you would find that the wait is months. Now, there are things that we can do to try to make sure that people recognize, well, but Renaissance is providing great care in a very nice center and an important part of the city. But some people have always gone to Bellevue. They want to go to Bellevue. And so, I mean, in an ideal world, you try to move resources rather than people, right? You try to let people choose and then move the resources to that. But of course, you know, facilities, space is an issue. Right, support staff is an issue, and so it's never even. Um, and I, again, I don't, I don't think that we have done a good enough job of really focusing on what is it that the patients need and how do we provide that. I think it's been too much about the bureaucracy and not enough about the actual patients. And you know, that's something people understand that I, I, I don't accept and that we can change. So I just want to ask one question about Metro Plus, and I know that um, my colleague has a question. So I know you had goals to enroll a million at some point, um, and now you're looking to achieve, I think it's a 675,000 member goal outlined in the transformation plan. So what I wanted to ask was, you know, New York City is home to nearly one million people who lack health insurance. And there are a lot of communities such as Bushwick, Brooklyn, that presents uninsured rates of more than 22%. So you've stated that a large percentage of this uninsured population is actually insurable. And what, what informs this assumption? Uh, the information we have about demographics and, and income level and, the, you just, and taking an overall assessment of the percent of low-income people in New York City who are documented and would be able to uh, receive insurance. Also, uh, part of what I've learned about uh, historic, and this is not what we're doing today, but this is historic, is if somebody just said, I'd just like to be in options, I'm not interested in applying, we just say fine, which again is not the right answer for the system or or for that person. So in a sense, 
Of course it's that, right? I mean, it's, this is not, the, the system was not created to say the way I would think we would all want it. The, the great value of a sliding scale system is we want it to be, ideally I would say free or very, very low cost. Sometimes, sometimes it's good for, sometimes people appreciate paying $2 or $5 and make, making their contribution. But for people who are not eligible, but if you have a system where it's actually easier to not apply for insurance, which is our current system, then people don't join. Um, so that is very much, I, I, I want to say changed. It is certainly changing. I don't think we yet have enough people at all of the hospitals for engaging people who may have been on the you know, the options program sliding scale, who nobody ever said, you know, I'll help you. Um, let's get you on to coverage. And again, it's not an immediate answer because remember that unlike Medicaid, the exchange has an open enrollment period. So the truth is if someone comes today, it can actually help them to enroll in the exchange. Um, so, but we can, for the first time in health and hospitals, now say, hey, you're on the sliding scale. You are eligible for the exchange. We're going to continue to provide the sliding scale for you until the open enrollment period, of course. But then once the open enrollment period comes, we'll be helping you to move on to the exchange. And not only will you not be paying more, you'll be paying less. And we're making sure that in every case, the helping people to be on the exchange, if they're eligible, will be a better deal for them. For people who are not eligible for the exchange, then of course we should provide the most generous sliding scale possible. So that's what hasn't happened. There is the city's efforts, again, have been focused in the community, which again is wonderful. And I'm sure our numbers would be way worse without that. But here, we're actually seeing the people. They're coming to us. They're in front of us. And, but we've never said, well, but we want to help you to apply for insurance. So it, it is a culture change. Well, like, yeah, I think you, you need people there to help people navigate the system and fill out the paperwork, which could be in itself incredibly intimidating. And then there's the language access and, and you know, the education disparities. You mentioned in your testimony creative use of, of pharmacists and nurses and when we're thinking of all the comprehensive services that you have to provide to a constituent to make sure that they understand their rights and what's available, you know, I just encourage you to make sure that, you know, nurses do their job and doctors do their job, but that we're also utilizing the community-based organizations in the area that are helping t people navigate because there is already trust established in, in, those, in those organizations. Um, I, I want to let my colleague ask his question since we did mention Bushwick. Uh, Council Member Reynoso. Thank you. You were doing a great job, Chair. I would, I would have sat here all day listening to, to the questions that you were asking. It's extremely insightful. Um, this being a new committee, uh, I being a new member of this committee, uh, I'm learning a lot about one local hospitals in my district, like Wood Hall, but also just, the, um, the, just the, the uninsured rate situation in Bushwick for it to be one of the highest in the city of New York. Um, I'm really looking forward to being able to tackle that issue um, with partners like the chairwoman and also um, in health and hospitals. Uh, but again, this is, this, I'm, I'm grateful for the health and hospitals committee. Um, uh, I wanted to ask, uh, gentrification. Uh, it exists in many areas in which your hospitals, um, uh, in, in communities where your hospitals are. Williamsburg, Bushwick, and Bed-Stuy being one of those in Woodhull, for example. Uh, so I see a decline year in and year out in Woodhull Hospital, for example, in patient visits, which I wasn't aware of until this hearing. Um, just want to speak to how do you attract uh, uh, populations that have traditionally probably went to private hospitals um, um, so they could come back to a hospital like a Woodhull um, and not go to a private hospital. I just want to know 
do you even take that into consideration or is there, are all populations treated the same or, or the strategies, I guess, are all the same? Because I'm concerned now, just like in my schools, my schools are under-enrolled by, under by 50 and 60% in some cases because these new families coming into the district still haven't created, you know, they still don't have children, but now we're starting to see an increase in enrollment 10 years later when those new people moved in and now are starting to have families, we're starting to see enrollment go back up um, and, and we're looking forward to that in our schools. Does that apply in hospitals in any way, that, that looking at the demographics of a population, how they're shifting, how they're changing, and the physical, the physical space where a hospital is in? Sure. Well, first of all, I have to tell you, uh, touring Woodhull with you was like being with a rock star. A number of people who came up to you, who recognized you, who knew you from the neighborhood, really did my heart good. And it's one of the things that's so much fun about being back in New York City, is New York City has always been a town of neighborhoods. Yes. Um, and, you know, I, I love the intense ethnic mix, the, the fact that Polish is one of, like, who would, who would have thought that, right? I mean, is, is one of the three languages, you know, of Woodhall. I mean, it, it's, it's the thing I most love love about New York City and it was it was I really appreciated you know going with you I appreciated the 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 uh, for everybody to know your uh, the council members tweet about having his baby at Woodhall was something we got a ton of response you know the midwife greeted him like you know he was you know a, a close member of her family it, w it was very positive I think that the that the hospitals of health and hospitals are very attractive places to get care. Um, we have academic affiliations. Um, we have doctors, and this this is very important to me, who are salaried. They're not. They don't make money by sending people for unnecessary procedures. Um, they they only have the focus of the patient in mind, and Woodhall is filled with really thoughtful, terrific doctors. I think our challenge in attracting people is that we have not put as much effort into answering the telephones, having, you know, friendly schedules, right, the sort of customer service. Um, and people make, dis make decisions sometimes. I mean, I think that in the mo at the end of the day, you want to see really great doctors and nurses and pharmacists and social workers. But I get it that if, if you call and nobody answers the phone, you're like, what's going on here? I'm going somewhere different. So I think if we uh, solve, and we will, um, the, the customer service patient experience part, um, which will involve some facilities. You know, I, you and I were together. Uh, I have seen many, many public hospitals in my life uh, of all sorts. Um, ED, Woodhull, not enough space, right? That's not a modern, you can't, you can't line up gurney, 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 gurney. That's, I mean, that, that, that's my 1980s residency. That's not what anybody considers modern healthcare uh, we have, thanks to you, a plan a about fixing that. Uh, but I think that we can attract paying patients, and we also always want to be relevant to people who are uninsured and can't pay. I mean, that, that's our core mission. I just feel we're good enough. You know, when I, when I came here, one of the things that I wanted when I chose my benefits is I made sure I chose a plan that I could go to health and hospitals with, because uh, not all the city plans can you use health and hospitals, right? So I chose one that, that would enable me to take my, to me and my family to health and hospitals. Uh, I want us all to use our own hospitals, and I think that in and of itself will improve the quality when people see, you know, someone like you, it makes them feel good. My hospital is good enough that the council member chose to come here, and then it's also just another set of eyes and ears Right, so you might say, you know, I got great service, but I noticed there was a woman who was waiting several hours at radiology, right? So I think it's something we can do together. So I'm glad, I'm glad to hear the customer service part. I agree 100%. I, I never name dropped when I went to Woodhull um, in, at any time. I never told them I was a council member. I just wanted to be a normal person walking into Woodhull so I don't get special treatment. And in doing so, I found, you know, I, I waited two hours 
one time to go see a, a midwife. I waited three hours one day. Then another day I waited like 30 minutes, right? So it like varied. Um, and, and I just wanted to see the experience. I wanted to talk to the finance person. I wanted to do everything. And, I, and it worked um, because I got an eye-opening experience there. And, and I want to be able to express that to you in a, in a positive way. I want to use it, my experience, as a way to make it better. Um, so, so just to go to that tour, I'm glad you came. They, they're very, they were very excited that you were there as well. Um, the whole team showed up. There were folks I hadn't seen in a long time in that, in that tour. Um, but I'm glad you saw the ED because I don't know what a good ED looks like because all I know is Woodhull. So I, I, I asked you that. I asked, what, in the scale of one through 10, where does Woodhull rank among you know, hospitals? And I, I love Woodhull, I think it's amazing. And you were like, well, it's like kind of in the middle. Have you seen Harlem Hospital is what you told me. And I haven't seen it. I'm excited to take a tour one day. But I guess that's the next part. Capital dollars. We have a lot of opportunity in capital funding, that short-term investments into city sites, like let's say a Woodhull, that we can really invest in um, that we can take advantage of like right now when the city's doing well, when we have the revenue. And I looked at your budget and it, it, it is, is an increase in the capital budget, but only slightly, not an increase where these one shot deals, right? This is gonna happen half a million dollars or half a million dollars one time for this. Uh, it's not something, it's not, it's not like a long-term contract of a baseball player, right? You, you're, it's, one, it's a one shot deal, it's a one year contract. Why not take advantage of that to, to upgrade Woodhull right now to a place where it looks like a Harlem hospital. Like, I'm just seeing the budget. I don't see that, that being a part of it, like actually upgrading the facilities. Right. Um, well, again, I, I'm happy to work with you. I'm still learning, you know, like how to do the things that you just said. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, some of it we have to acknowledge and what I meant by Woodhull in the beginning and for those people who haven't seen, and Harlem Hospital was recently rebuilt. Yeah, I know. Right? Yeah, it's course, beautiful, yes. yeah. right? It's an example of how you should build a public hospital. It both respects the history, phenomenal uh, world uh, from the Roosevelt era, the, the WPA murals that capture African Americans and their, their life in New York uh, and in the U.S., beautiful, right? It's just what you should do, respect the past, um, but build a hospital in the future. We won't, I mean, Woodhall is, you know, I think 25, 30 years old. Um, it, was more built, than 30, yeah. it was built under a hospital design that I don't think most people would today have chosen. You, unlike, you go into Harlem, um, and uh, actually the same is true of Jacoby, and it's the modern idea. You go into a hospital lobby, and you want it to be like very high, so you get this feeling of space, right? Well, Woodhall was built on a, you know, a different idea. You walk in, and it does feel a little cramped. Can't fix that, but we can fix the ED. There's simply not enough space. Um, and part of the problem w will be solved by the movement of the program that we looked at behavioral health to a different floor. But I'm happy to explore with you. I mean, would, and, and again, this is, you know, uh, my overall message, you know, we can do this. We don't have to shrink and close and go away. We can make a different decision that, that it may be, you know, again, not every place will do everything, but Woodhall is a vital place. Brooklyn itself is growing uh, in overall population. Um, Brooklyn has also lost hospitals, other hospitals. Um, so, you know, we should really look at how we make the facility as great as all those Woodhall people are. So now the facility space, so now does Harlem Hospital have a higher enrollment after its renovation than it did, let's say, the years prior to. Um, is there a difference? Does it, does, do the renovations matter? Do they attract people? A modern hospital, is it attractive to people? Or are they seeing in, uh, patients coming in at the same decline or rate of decline as every other health and hospital facility? I, d I, don't, I don't have it, but you know what, even if I, and we'll get you the exact numbers, two things. First, you want people to feel like they're getting quality care and the care that everybody else is getting, it's not psychologically good to be in a facility that's outmoded, right? It, that sends a message, and it sends a message to staff as well, 
right? I mean, you don't want to build institutional hospitals that make people feel like I'm in this hospital because I'm poor, right? You want to you create hospitals that say my life is worth the same thing as anybody else's life. Um, so, you know, I think the morale reasons alone, but certainly in other settings, I am aware that when, when a new hospital opens, this was certainly our, our, what we found when we opened up Martin Luther King Junior Hospital in LA, a new hospital attracts people. Um, so there, there, there is value, there is value, and there are ways of, right, you don't have to knock them down necessarily, right? There are creative ways, and we should look at Woodhall and ask ourselves, you know, what are those creative ways that we make the space. I mean, the rooms themselves were all really nice. This is that lobby that gives you that. I agree. So um, the last thing is the uh, the savings through attrition is that we that through attrition that we've worked with on the past that obviously you believe doesn't make any sense. It, it makes sense to me that if you have a primary care doctor or a hospital that could take a call for an appointment to a primary care doctor, like you can see in the next three days. Um, that person or that doctor could generate um, revenue for the hospital systems and for themselves. But if we don't have that person, then the hospital can't take advantage of it, and then you're waiting 30, 40 days, and then you just don't show up, so you lose the, the opportunity. So I'm excited to hear that from you because um, that, that was something that I was looking at here is the, the rate of attrition and, and it looking like a highlight um, and not looking like it was going to go up, but it could just be the way I was reading this. But um, looking at the plan, I just want to go through it, maybe the, the chair can, can help me understand it. Um, it's on page. Okay, so I don't see the page here. Uh, but one of the graphs show that we are going through attrition, and it doesn't necessarily show that it's an increase in 19, fiscal year 19 and, and 20. So I just wanted to get clarity. On well, that. again, I, what I can promise you is that attrition was successful in getting the budget uh, targets met. Uh, but at this point, having met the targets, uh, I'm committing to you to work with you on what I would see as policy-oriented finances, where you decide what remains not based on attrition, mm -hmm. but based on the priorities of this council, the mayor's office, you know, the doctors and nurses who work at health and hospitals, we all work together to decide that we are spending more in this areas, less in this areas, because that's what our patients need, not because someone retired. All right, so you're saying not replacing someone for the sake of, like, oh, if we don't need a nurse and one, one retires and we don't need a, but, but maybe we need somebody that does something else, we could hire them. We just want to be smarter about how we do it it's not just about replacing the person that goes right away. That's uh, right. But the headcount is at 44,768, which is um, very low. And it's a, we're talking about two, a two-year run where we lost over four to 5,000 employees in the health and hospitals, <coughs> right? So you know, just want to get your perspective on, on headcount and what you right. think about that. Well, again, I, I, I wasn't here, but, but circumstances were pretty extreme. Yeah. And I certainly understand that, that uh, the city, um, which was very generous to health and hospitals, that there were limits on you know, what could be done. And the attrition was health and hospitals doing its part. Um, and I think that, that people did a great job. But again, you can't run long term an organization on attrition. There can't be a long term strategy. It can be a you know, temporizing strategy, and I think it was very successful at that, and the people who did it deserve credit for that. But it can't be how we go forward. We're not, the, the, the path to success of health and hospitals is not attrition. Yes, Thank, well, that's, that's all I wanted to hear, because that 44,000 number is already too low in my estimation, and I just hope that while you're in leadership, we don't see that number continue to go down, because this means a lot more than just the health care of the city of New York. You're talking about uh, employment of many people that are extremely valuable in the city of New York. Um, and I just want to make sure that we stabilize and move forward and we grow out of this, is the way you said it. We're going to grow out of this uh, deficit. I'm excited to see that. But again, I want to thank the chairwoman for giving me so much time. Uh, but um, 
very excited to be a partner with both of you to make this, to, to really push health and hospitals to the future. Thank you. So I wanted to go back to workforce because I think that's really important. And according to the latest uh, key indicator report that you share at your finance committee for your uh, board of directors meeting, since November 2015, so global FTEs, full-time equivalents, at health and hospitals has decreased by 4,641 positions to, to 40, oh, hold on, let me make sure I have this right. Have decreased. So how many of these reductions occurred among consultants? And I wanted to know, going back to the council member's question, which facilities experienced the most attrition during this period? Consultants are separate. Yes. So consul the consultants are, are completely separate savings. And really quickly, and I know, um, I'm sorry I asked you two questions, but I'm gonna add a third one. If you could s talk a little bit about the, the layoffs that you made recently at the central office, and the th you said there's 35 positions, you're gonna save X amount of millions of dollars, right. and kind of the decision that led to that. Sure, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave my P uh, for my CFO to see if he can, if the, we have attrition information by facility, I don't, I don't know if we do or don't. Um, so the consultants are separate. So the headcount are people like myself who work for health and hospitals. So uh, I do think um, that to some extent, some of the the least uh, successful consultants were times when people we're using it as a workaround to the hiring freeze. So people wanted certain functions done, hiring freeze didn't f prevented them from hiring someone, so people hired instead consultants at higher cost. Um, and you know, my view has always been that the good government answer is to work with people, right? If, if you can't, if you, if, if someone says, well, you, you can't hire someone because we're on hiring freeze, you don't go and hire a consultant at a higher wage, right? That's not a, m that won't happen uh, with me Under at health and ho hospitals. I don't, I don't support that. I'm not a survivalist. I'm somebody who really believes in open government and growing for the right reasons. Uh, th that isn't, there's no money being saved in that, and that's part of why it was relatively easy to achieve large savings in consultants. When, when we had found a function um, that we needed, I said, that's fine, but then let's hire somebody to do that function, and that will ultimately cost less money. Have you cut, um, have you, I guess, increased savings in terms of consultants since the last hearing? You had a uh, number that you had as a goal, you exceeded the number that you had told me before the hearing. Yes. And since then, have you made any further cuts? Yes, but I don't have a, I know the consultants that I stopped, but I don't have a dollar. Do you have any other dollar? Um, on on the, the last time we met, um, we indicated the number of consultants. The total <coughs> reduction, if you give me a minute, was about- I think about you said 16, 16 million. million. So, but we, we, so uh, this week I, uh, eliminated within two different consultants a scope of work, but that was literally this week, and so I don't, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I wasn't thinking in terms of this hearing what would be necessary. In one case, it was a clinical function that I said that should be done by our doctors and nurses. Hmm. Um, I don't, I don't want outside opinions on how to do this. I want our own doctors and nurses to decide because that's the only way it's going to happen. In the other case, it was, it was a survey of data that I knew would be no different than it was two years earlier. And I said, let's use the two years ago data. Nothing's changed. It's not worth spending the money. So that was yesterday. So, I mean, I think what you, what you have from me, and you know, I think my staff understand this, the money is for the patients. That's what we're here for. We're here to take care of people. So I'm all for spending money on doctors and nurses and pharmacists and social workers and the people who support them. But otherwise, I'm not in favor of spending money. So things have to, you have to explain, you know, and, and there are explanations. I mean, IT is a perfect example, right? You do, the care of patients does depend on high quality IT. So yes, IT, that doesn't mean I support all IT projects. 
I want to know how with each project, and I, I have a, a terrific uh, Chief Information Officer, Kevin Lynch, who's here, right? And he, I always refer to him as the, the primary care doctor of IT because, you know, on day three he was out at Bellevue dealing with a frustration that the doctors were facing with our current system and fixing it. But even for IT, it has to be how, if I agree to this expense, explain to me how the care of my patients is going to be better. So the 35 positions that we let go of last Friday was not, it was not because we were overstaffed, it was not because there was anything wrong with the job that the 35 people were doing, it was that the central office functions to me are simply not as important as having adequate staffing in our clinical areas. And if I, as has happened to me, as I've toured the facilities and I've seen nurse ratios where I don't think there are enough nurses, and I've seen EDs where I don't think there is enough coverage, how can I explain or defend to anyone why I might have an administrative function in central office? There's nothing wrong with that function. And in the difficult, you know, weeks leading up to that, one of the things that I comforted myself with is maybe we'll grow these back. I just have to feel that I can't accept having an administrative position if I can't deliver care. The first priority has to be the care of the patient. And so none of the 35 are positions related to patient care. All right, I wanna ask about correctional health. You know what? You're gonna, I know you have a, a, a time stop. I'm fine. I wanna be fair. I'm fine. Okay, all right. So, well, oh, are you gonna be testifying? I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, 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 Patsy Yang is our head of correctional health and she just, uh, knowing that, that I, I value her input, came up to the table in case there were questions that I couldn't answer myself. All right, so, Thank you. Let me ask you really quickly about capital funding while uh, I still have my, the, my colleague here. So we talked a little bit about your spending and spending about 202 million of the planned 881 million from 2017. I wanna know what, what can h and do to improve its capital planning and spending? I know you said you're learning and we're all learning together. But I want to know what, what's really in the pipeline in order to meet its commitment targets in the next few, in the future fiscal years. Because as you mentioned, there's a lot of room for improvement in terms of interest, infrastructure that will hopefully bring in new patients, but that will better serve the existing patients. So what is the plan to meet your targets and spend the money that's already committed? Sure. I think that the money hasn't been spent because uh, we're coming off of a year of a, a terrific interim, but he very much saw himself as an interim. Uh, he did a phenomenal job uh, at that. Um, but that because of that, the, the organization hasn't had for a while someone with a long-term commitment to the organization, um, which is what I have. Um, and so I think just decisions got deferred because there, the needs way exceed that dollar amount, which then requires challenging decisions. Do you do this hospital? Do you do this hospital? Do you do this clinic? Do you do that clinic? And because there, there hasn't been a steady leadership, those decisions haven't been made. Uh, the, the one request that I, that I ask of you is, I'm not someone who makes these kinds of decisions from central office, and so, uh, I know that people have waited, and I feel bad about that, but I don't want to now say, okay, well, Mitch thinks the five most important projects are. I, I want to, with the council, with the mayor's office, with the hospital people, really look at it and figure out which are the things that are the most important to us. And so uh, what I can promise is, you know, I intend to be here a long time, and that once we're in, you know, we're together on what the plan is, the money won't go unspent. I, to some extent, I prefer that the money went unspent than it was spent on the wrong things, because at least it's not lost to us. On the other hand, I get your other point, that people are going today, right, and they're not benefiting today. One of the areas 
um, that I felt very strongly about and we're now working on is uh, Bellevue's psychiatric emergency room. It's, uh, from my point of view, a grossly inadequate place to be taking care of people. Um, it is too small, it's the wrong facility, um, it needs quite work. Now fortunately there is a plan whereby we're going to move a group of people to an empty ward for observation. Um, so there is a plan, but I've asked, you know, for, and I, again, to me it's the most basic things, you know, why does this environment look like a jail? Why is it painted institutional green? If there, I mean, I understand that in a ward f for people who are psych, uh, have psychotic, active psychotic disease or suicidal, you can't have things that people can just grab and throw at someone. But that doesn't mean that you should paint everything institutional green, right? You could have murals on the wall. For that matter, you could have murals on the ceiling. So if you're on a gurney because you're not able to control the movement of your body, there's something pleasant to look up at, right? It doesn't have to seem like people are in jail. And some of that is not so expensive. Some of that is simply saying that these patients matter. They're having a hard time at this moment. They may need to be restrained, but not because they've done anything illegal. Let's treat them in an environment that is more healing. Um, so uh, I, I want to, with you, really now look at the, the different facilities um, with an eye to, you know, what do we want in the next five years um, and I promise, at least while it may be delayed, the money will be well spent. So, uh, you know, we all have our priorities, of course, as council people and our <coughs> responsibilities to our constituents. And I, I'm sure I can speak on behalf of my colleagues in saying that we'll do whatever we have to do to expedite conversations and making a list of priorities. And myself even recognizing that there are hospitals that have bigger needs than maybe the hospitals in my own district. I'm willing to have that conversation and talk about poverty and immigrant populations and undocumented and places like Elmhurst that are completely full and how we really have to look to those places and, and put resources. So we will do whatever we can to expedite those conversations. You have that full commitment from us because I think nothing is more important than your health. I want to ask about the local health clinics and kind of demystifying the process of applying for capital funds for these more locally based clinics. So. Health clinics in my district have recently applied, and OMB and H&H &H have denied their funding requests. So for example, this is really Roberto Clemente uh, Mental Health Center, which you mentioned before, had a couple of requests that were denied, and, and, and it's an ongoing, I know, and, and somewhat arduous and complicated process. So I wanted to ask if you could walk us through H&H's centralized capital request process. And for example, what factors other than, of course, cost and the lifespan of, of the request itself do you consider when you determine final eligi eligibility for these projects? Uh, so um, le let me start by saying that the council's report on um, health and hospitals was really well written and actually gave me insights into it from an outside perspective and, and it notes very nicely in there that our commitment last year has gone down significantly. And as Dr. Katz pointed out, um, it was clearly the reason um, uh, of, of looking more strategically in terms of where health and hospitals was going and our focus turned away from capital and focused more on normal reconstruction work. And of course our IT projects are, are a large part of it. So, um, and, and you also know that the history of health and hospitals is that it used to be networks. It used to be five separate networks. They all made individual decisions on their own. Um, and by converting it from a network basis to a system, um, um, took a lot of, of work at central office to bring collaboration to everybody um, to get to the place of really evaluating a business plan for all capital projects. So we've actually come up with a process right now 
that if any of the facilities want to invest in capital equipment, that they should go through a process of evaluating what it would cost, what the um, returns were expected out of it in terms of uh, improved patient care, improved revenues, operating expenditures. So there is an entire process that has been set up now, and it is just rolling out. So um, we've actually made that system uh, available. We also have invested in a system-wide accounting system that, and, and a budgeting system that will allow us to look at what the requests are from all of the facilities and make assessments based on the information that they provided. So um, it's at the beginning stages of it. So um, I can't, I can't um, give you an update on, on that particular capital project that you mentioned, but uh, clearly we are on our way to having a structured approach to this. Okay. Okay, great. All right, so I wanted to get into correctional health and I wanted to ask um, if you plan on answering any of the questions to, of course, administer the oath. Sure. Sure, okay. So do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Great. Okay, so the fiscal 2019 preliminary budget included increased funding for correctional health services that's in Brooklyn, Staten Island, the Bronx, and Queens. And the planned funding increases from 3.9 million in fiscal 2019 to 6.3 in fiscal 2020 and 7.4 million in the out years. So how is, correct, how is CHS uh, going to use the increased funding to expand its operations over the course of the plan and what's the timeline for implementation? Okay, yeah, um, so, so thank you. Um, the, that budget, we, Correctional Health has been very fortunate since um, it moved over to Health and Hospitals in terms of city investment by, by the mayor and the council um, to improve and enhance our services. This most recent um, funding has um, will allow us to expand a number of critical programs, one of which is the naloxone distribution um, that Dr. Katz mentioned. Currently is being done only at Rikers at the visitor center. It will allow us to expand it to all the other borough jails. So we'll be doing the exact same thing, which is training people who come and visit people, their, their loved ones in the jails, so that they can also um, um, have Nar Narcan. Um, another one is our um, enhanced pre-arraignment screening, which we started in, in November of 2016 in Manhattan, as Dr. Katz also mentioned. Um, this uh, is part of, this started as, as a pilot program on our part to replace what is currently a stipulation on the city um, to do a, a pre arraignment screening on individuals who might be at risk of medical, a medical condition that needs emergent attention. Um, right now in the rest of the city, except for Manhattan, it's being done by EMTs. Um, our proposal, which has just been funded, will allow us to expand our enhanced pr proposal, which has clinicians, nurses, um, and in Manhattan, um, we went 24-7 in this program in November 2016, and just in that first year of operation, um, we screened the, over 53,000 people just in Manhattan 24-7, and we reduced by almost one quarter the number of people who, who would have otherwise been transported to a hospital emergency department, which would have clogged up the emergency departments, but also um, commanded resources from F, um, FIDNI, from Fire Department EMS, and New York Police Department in terms of escorting people. It would also disrupt their uh, judicial processing and, and during the, the arraignment process. Um, the pre-arraignment screening program has also been really, really efficacious in that it allows us to identify people who may have conditions, social, behavioral, mental health, substance use conditions, um, which with client um, consent we provide to the defense who bring that information to the case before the judge that can sometimes result in better outcomes, um, better dispositions, alternatives to incarceration, diversion centers, treatment centers. Um, and finally, the other good thing about the pre-arraignment screening is that it allows us to identify people who may be at high risk so that if they do end up in jail, we'll know to expedite them through intake. We might know that they might be um, detoxing, they might be diabetics who need insulin. Um, we can identify them before they get in um, to jail. So that's actually expanding from Manhattan to over the next few years to Brooklyn, the Bronx, and Queens, the other borough houses, which we think will be really significant in terms of diverting people to alternatives um, and reducing risk of death or, or bad outcomes. Um, the other programs that we're, we're also getting are, are to improve mental health services for women in jail. Um, and that's everything from 
uh, standing up a program for screening and connecting them with safety planning for, for women who may be at risk for intimate, in, intimate partner violence, to bringing some mental health services to women who are in our medical infirmary. Um, there's programs like that. I want to ask specifically about Rikers Island, and I have some questions that I'm going to ask that I ask the Department of Corrections. But first, one of the adjustments in the fiscal 2019 preliminary plan, it, it concerned the purchase and installation of a modular trailer on Rikers Island that was going to provide program space for CHS. So I, I have a question as to why H&H &H used expense funding to purchase the trailer, which is $1.6 million, rather than secure capital funding for the purchase. Um, it, it's, um, the capital review process on that um, goes through Bond Council at OMB, and and, and it was pr probably deemed ineligible for capital funding. Anything that the, the minimum requirements on a capital project require a certain life on, on, on the uh, project itself and, mod and movable equipment and modular um, furniture don't necessarily fit those criteria. So you're, you're saying that you chose to use expense because the trailer wouldn't last five years? Um, that's, I'm, I'm saying this as, as a, more of a, um, a guess from my past life than actual knowledge about it, but I know for certain that OMB would almost always prefer to use capital funds over expense um, dollars. So um, the only thing that comes to mind in terms of why they would not have chosen that option would be because it did not satisfy the life. Clearly, the dollar value that we're expending on that is sufficient for capital um, guidelines. So, but, but we'll follow up and, and see if that is a, something to be changed. That would, I would, yeah, if you could follow up, because I just asked that we, we just discuss capital funding, eligibility, criteria, what groups and organizations have to go through, and I just ask that you apply the same criteria to your own purchases that you do outside organizations who are also trying to help the community. So the plan also allocates $86,000 in fiscal 2018 and $79,000 in fiscal 2019 to educate direct care providers on linkages to pediatric endocrinology and to other transgender youth medical services as part of the Unity Project, the city's first multi-agency strategy to enhance services for LGBTQ youth. And currently, how many direct care providers at H&H &H are equipped to address the endocrinology needs of transgender youth? And secondly, how many trainings will the funding support and how many providers will it reach? And can you also speak to how this kind of project is being implemented or I guess being used at, at correctional health facilities because of the LGBTQ community? Uh, I don't believe it is part of the Correctional Health Services Program. It is um, specifically, specifically LGBTQ youth transgender community and how you're addressing some of those health needs and some of also the issues that happen in, in that population. Right, I, I, I think, uh, Chairperson, I'll have to get back to you on, on some of the exact notes. I mean, I've taken care of many transgender people in my career as a primary care doctor. And so most internists and most pediatricians would be capable of doing hormonal therapy. I know that uh, Health and Hospitals has several really fine uh, centers for the care of LGBTQ um, people, youth. Uh, I'm very proud that, to find that, that New York City has it. I, I can't say that I have detailed data I'm looking to be. Uh, so I would have to, on the sort of number of patients, number of providers, I'd have to get back to you on that. I'm going to ask um, if my council member has a question. Council member Steve Urban. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Rivera. Uh, thank you all uh, uh, for your testimony. I um, wanted to follow up on the questions that I had at our last hearing a couple weeks ago um, uh, regarding uh, efforts around confronting the opioid epidemic in, in New York City and, and what role H&H &H plays in that. Um, is there any FY19 
um, allocations or new uh, budget lines or uh, new initiatives um, in the preliminary budget under H&H &H that are designed specifically to confront the opioid epidemic, uh, looking at what they're doing elsewhere, other cities, other jurisdictions? I know we're set to expand programming. I can't answer, is there a dollar? Um, I, I don't have any answer at this point, but we can get back to you on that. Okay, I mean, I, what I would like to see in the executive budget is um, uh, some, some new programming. It could be uh, pilot programming, um, you know, really exploring uh, ways in which H and H can um, uh, partner with DOHMH on some of the things that they're doing over there. Um, you know, obviously uh, looking at some of the policy recommendations, whether it's uh, safe injection facilities, which we're hoping the mayor comes out in support of in the coming days, um, uh, or other harm reduction uh, models. Or, and, and, and as we talked about in our, in our last conversation, um, uh, increasing access um, to, to long-term uh, medical treatment, uh, uh, medical intervention, um, whether it's through methadone or buprenorphine, uh, or, and, and then also advancing peer-to-peer -peer counseling, um, particularly when people are overdosing and going into health and hospitals um, or emergency room. So, those are the types of things I would, I would hope that there might be some new uh, resources in your uh, executive expense budget to, to, to try to scale up some of those or pilot some of those. Um, so, but, but at the moment in your prelim, nothing specifically designed to do that. That, that? That's correct. What I would say is that I can't think of anything more valuable to spend our money on. Yeah. So Absolutely. regardless of, you know, I mean, to some extent, uh, there is no, if a new drug gets approved, I don't mean in opiates, there's no specific allocation for X new drug, but we all start using it, right? We're in the midst of this epidemic that's killing people. We every seven use, hours in New York City, every seven hours somebody we dies. We should use every resource we have, yep. right? I don't need a separate line item. Right, I mean, I, for some of the kind of those, those maybe pilot programs, uh, you know, th th if you're going to be paying peers to, to be in, uh, in, in emergency rooms, that's, that money's got to come from somewhere, and they got to have a supervisor, and they got to have, you know, a wraparound service, you know, the sure. uh, uh, fringe and whatnot. So, um, you know, all of that, uh, you know, I, I would hope to see maybe some, some even if it's, even if it's uh, you know, relatively modest. I would love to see something in the executive budget that says this is going to be some new funding dedicated within the H&H &H budget. Because um, there's, there's a huge coordinating, I mean, frankly, like last year in the, in the um, Healthy, um, or Healing NY, uh, NYC plan, you know, health and hospitals is, 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 is uh, put forward and put out there as the backbone uh, for uh, that's that that medical service delivery, uh, you know, in the future. For all, you know, not, it's not even DOHMH so much as it's health and hospitals is the one that's going to be uh, taking on uh, a major role in that. And when I talk to uh, uh, homeless service providers, um, you know, they have a lot of questions about how how they're going to be working with H and H to uh, to ensure that. Um, that there's, there's access to, to long-term medically assisted treatment and so, so on and so forth. Understood. Thank yeah, you. I yeah. fully agree. Okay. So let's, maybe let's, let's work on that and, and see if we can get that, uh, some, new, some new budget lines in the executive budget. Excellent. That'd be great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Of course. And I just, of course, Steve Levin has joined us, as has uh, my colleague Francisco Moya. And I just want to say... You know, we saw an independent budget office report that said from 2009 to 2014, mental health hospitalizations at H and H had increased by 20 percent, while mental health hospitalizations at voluntary hospitals had decreased by 5 percent. So it's clear the need is there, and people are going to H and H, and the reimbursement for those hospitalizations are very, very low. So when you do come back to us with your the fleshed out seven point plan and whatever it's going to look like. Please, real dollar commitments to serving this, this vulnerable and important population that continues to come to our city's health system for service. 
So I just wanted to underline that and say, um, uh, Council Member Moya, you had a question? Thank you, um, Madam Chairwoman, for um, your uh, great questions and to um, President Katz, thank you for once again uh, being here. Um, just two quick questions. In your testimony, you spoke about the renovation and expanding the adult emergency room at uh, Elmhurst Hospital. Can you just walk me through what the phases are going to be? Do you have that information? Does anyone have that information? Um, we do have it. It's built out into four phases, um, and I'm, I'm trying to find it as we speak. Um, the, the, they were going to start off with um, the adult ED, move on to the pediatric section, build out a CPEP uh, unit, and then circle back and build out uh, the balance of the uh, adult ED. So that was about, I think the project is around $30 million or so. Right. And but when will it, when is the start and finish? I think it is. Um, um, at the facility right now, finishing up the design stages. Once they're done with that, they will uh, reach out to central office and Dr. Katz for consultation to make sure everything is in keeping with the rest of the organization, and then we'll move on beyond that. Will you please keep me informed of what that looks like, um, given the fact that that emergency room is, uh, as you all know, busting at the seams and what yes. kind of disruption that may have um, on the impact of people going there, um, because that's, that's really important yes. uh, to know that the time frame. Um, and it's very welcome that uh, we're having the expansion uh, that comes in. Uh, also, in fiscal uh, 2018 to 2022, in the preliminary capital plan, which includes 2.5 million for Elmhurst to replace its uh, uh, equipment to renovate the facility suite, including $500,000 this fiscal year, uh, the angiography equipment. The plan also includes $2.3 million to construct a women's health pavilion at Elmhurst. Uh, can you uh, provide status updates on these capital projects? And also, uh, how do these projects and other capital projects in the plan um, inform your vision for Elmhurst moving forward. Uh, is, is it okay if we got back to you on that? We can. Uh, Please. Okay. Thank, thank you, you so much. Th thank you, Mr. President. And thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. I would say every time you come here, just prepare for a question about Elmhurst. Anything in any of the council members' districts, just be ready. Just have, <laughs> just have everything on hand. So uh, thank you, Councilmember Moya, for your question and how important Elmhurst is to our H&H &H system. So just to go back to um, some of the questions I, I mentioned earlier that I had asked the Department of Corrections during the Criminal Justice Committee hearing. How many correctional health staff are on Rikers Island? Uh, we, we currently have about 1,651 FTEs, um, I'd say all but about 120 are either on Rikers Island or in the borough houses. We don't consider the nine jails on Rikers separate from the three borough jails. It's one large system, um, and our staff move from one to another as, as are needed. Oh, I see. So you consider them all together? We're one correctional right. health system. Okay. Okay. I appreciate that. So how many times a week does Department of Corrections and H&H &H staff meet? on a daily basis and on multiple levels. Certainly at the jail facilities themselves, we encourage problem solving. Um, so there's the clinic captains, the wardens, our service, our health service administrators, our, our, our supervising uh, medical directors and our directors of nursing. There's that core team. There's people actually in each clinic who meet every day. Then there's the middle levels around particular issues or standing meetings. And then there's the executive leadership. Do you think that the Department of Corrections staff is adequately trained um, in terms of mental health needs and identifying mental health consumers? Um, we, we have been working together um, to do more training, um, and it's not just on mental health um, and identifying people who are both staff and patients who may need some attention, um, but we're also doing increasingly more joint training since coming over to health and hospitals. Um, on de-escalation, on managing um, patients together, um, and, and de-escalating situations rather than, than letting them escalate on their own. 
And when Rikers Island does close, what is the plan for the mental health population that's on the island? Um, uh, the mental health population is a, is a large one, um, and, and their need, any, any individual patient's needs for services and, and placement will vary and fluctuate. Um, it can, a patient can deteriorate or improve, and that will dictate the, the services that we provide, the clinical services we provide. Um, we are envisioning that there would be mental health patients and varying types of mental health services and housing units in every one of the four jails that are that are anticipated at this point in time. We think it's as, as important, um, you know, the question here of, of cohort or catchment, um, you know, whether people are jailed by, um, by who they are or, or what clinical condition they may have um, versus where they live or, or their borough of, of um, adjudication and, and arraignment. Um, those are still questions that the city is, is grappling with, um, with input from all stakeholders. We are part of that conversation, um, but we think that because you have a particular condition with some exceptions, some <coughs> particular clinical exceptions, um, people should benefit as to be as close to their family or their, uh, uh, as, as anybody else. So before the plan to close Rikers Island was made public and there was, a, I guess, a somewhat clear timeline, de Blasio had mentioned, our mayor had mentioned building a state-of-the-art jail just for mentally ill patients. And since now, we, you know, we've kind of scrapped that plan. What is your assessment of the adequacy of the facilities on Rikers? And of course, in the borough jails as well. Yeah, um, the facilities are old. I think we all know that. Um, and, and to varying states of good operating and, and disrepair. Um, this is not a modern physical plant in any of the in any of the 12 jails that are in the city, um, and by 12 I include the the barge in the Bronx, um, and so there definitely needs to be physical improvements. It, they're by no means modern rehabilitative uh, environments. So we've started the process of planning for a new jail system, going to a more localized system um, because of the failure of Rikers Island and, and for a number of other reasons in that I think a lot of us believe that you, you are at, in a better place for rehabilitation if you are closer to home, closer to services, et cetera, and I think we all share those beliefs and values. So with this process of planning for a new jail system and closing the facility that's on Rikers Island, the administration has hired consultants to engage communities and begin the land use process. And the mayor's office of criminal justice has convened a task force to guide policy decisions. So given the sizable population, again, of the mentally ill, uh, New York is in our city's jail system, what role do you see CHS playing in the closure of Rikers and the placement of these individuals? We're absolutely foundational um, and, and have been in, asked to participate in that way. We're, we're a critical partner. Do you, does your long-term plan include a vision for jail-based health care? Yes. And at the new facilities? I'm sorry? at the new facilities as well? Yeah, where, wherever our patients are, we will be. Okay, and we just wanna again offer our support in, in these conversations because um, I for one think that there are a lot of people who are in jail right now who do not have the right medical assessment and who are not receiving proper and quality care and I know you're only as good as the resources that you get so when you mention that facilities are in disrepair and we do have capital funds that could perhaps be prioritized for some of these patients I really want us to work together and in, in putting together some priorities so so thank you for that all right so just one last question about about this I know that we've talked a lot and I want to thank uh, Levin, of course, for opening the door in terms of discussing mental illness and how important it is in H&H &H system. And we'll probably have a hearing just on this in April because it's so, so important, I think, to the future of New Yorkers. So at least 11% of the inmates in our city's jail system reportedly have severe mental illness, schizophrenia, bipolar, PTSD, a post-traumatic stress disorder. So what is the connection between the psychiatric patients in the H&H &H system and the seriously mentally ill people in the city's jail system? Well, uh, I know this one, which is that it's the same people going back and forth. 
and that uh, one of the things that's uh, very important to me to work on together is that I see in the current system for both mentally ill people and people who are addicted a whole. And the whole is something between inpatient acute services and outpatient services. Because most people who have serious mental illness and drug addiction, especially if they're homeless, are not going to be able to benefit from outpatient services. Outpatient services are a very reasonable way of taking care of people who have a home and have support. Um, they are working, it's the right thing. You go to your meetings before work, you go to your meetings after work. I think that's terrific. And I think there's actually research to say that for people with jobs and good support systems, you're probably better off in outpatient and not residential. Um, but in the case of people who are homeless, people who are in unsafe settings, uh, to me, the lack of something in the middle is a huge problem. I'll just give you one, one example. When I was uh, touring, now I think uh, it was it Lincoln, and I've, there were a group of five people sitting fully dressed in the emergency department. So I said, to the emergency room doctor, that's strange, they kind of look like visitors, what, but they're here in a patient section. He said they're waiting on their urine tox screen. Um, I said, why? He said, for detox. So it turns out that by New York State law, in order to enter detox, you have to have a positive urine showing that you've recently used. So I'm like, so you mean if someone is seriously addicted and they ha they've been fighting their addiction for two days and haven't used, and they're coming to us because they realize they're about to start using, we're gonna deny them treatment? And the answer is yes. You have to have a positive urine to enter a licensed detox. Well, so we need to create a different service model that is not sensible. Right. We, if somebody is seeking treatment for their addiction, we need to treat them. They don't, we don't want to be saying you have to go shoot up outside so that we can take you into our treatment. But at the same time, detox as a service is not, most people, when they're finished detoxing, they're not going to be able to live the rest of their life in sobriety. They're going to go back out and they're going to return to the same life that that they had before and they're gonna start using again. And the same about inpatient mental health. If you take somebody with serious psychosis, you can use inpatient psychiatry to change their treatment, but if they're then going back to living on the streets or in the shelter, they're gonna get worse again. So we need long-term, like three to six month settings to care for people with serious addictions and serious mental illness because otherwise they wind up back in jail. And I think that if we can create, you know, these three to six month periods of uh, good milieu treatment and medication, you will see that the number of people with serious mental illness in the jail system will decline. ask you about substance abuse I, you you of course there's the our, the inmate population there's of course trying to decrease recidivism and, and getting them proper care and I appreciate your comments on how health is so important you feel in terms of holistic approach to some someone's well-being I wanted to ask about um, opioid abuse um, there was a, a a very good hearing, a very long hearing here at the council about it because of the numbers and the cases that we're seeing here in New York City. And we saw Kaiser Health News recently profiled Colorado's Alternative to Opioids Project, which, which is just an effort to limit opioid use in emergency departments. So the 10 hospitals that participated in the project were able to reduce opioid use by 36% over six months. So has h and system explored similar strategies for limiting opioid use in its ERs? And for example, they mentioned using safer and less addictive alternatives to opioids such as ketamine and lidocaine. 
So uh, yes, Health and Hospitals has been engaging in a variety of initiatives to decrease opioids, but I, I think there's a way big distance to go. Um, I think that EDs are just the tip of the iceberg, and in fact, those people are already addicted. The people who are seeking opioids and EDs, they're addicted. That's why they're seeking the opioids and the EDs. So, so they need the appropriate treatment, and one of the things that makes me happy is that our emergency doctors are now able to prescribe buprenorphine um, and are thereby able to start treatment. Where I think there's a huge hole in what I think the research over the last two years has shown is that for some people biologically, one short prescription opioid treatment, which seems like a fairly minor thing, does lead to addiction. That people who may get seven days because of a tooth that's pulled or a broken bone, not everybody, but I think, you know, five years ago it was assumed that those prescriptions had nothing to do with the opioid epidemic. You know, that everything, the, the, the initial thinking was, what we need to do is to get doctors to stop prescribing for a month, for two months, or three months. But the newer research suggests that for some people, a seven to 10 day prescription is enough to turn their brain biology. They have no control over it. It's, it's I mean, this is, this is as physiologic as blood pressure, that they then, you know, become hooked. And so part of the effort has to be to both get doctors and patients who have ne not used opioids in the past to not use them, re which requires for both sides a sort of change in the mentality. And I know I've changed my own primary care practice from the point where I used to think, you know, someone has a, you know, a bad toothache, you know, help them you know, over the next three days. I don't want people to be in pain. Uh, and I still don't want people in pain, but I completely look at it differently now, and I tell people that. I say, you know, I know it really hurts, um, and it's not that I don't want to give you something that relieves the pain, but we found that a number of people who have never taken opioids before, when given this first prescription, if you follow them up at a year, a shocking number are, on, are taking opioids chronically. And so, you know, I, I really want you to try, you know, I know you're miserable, but I'm going to prescribe some ibuprofen. You know, I want to really use distraction and figure out how you, uh, you manage it. I had a patient who did really well with his Game Boy, you know, and he taught himself whenever his pain happened, he would start playing on the Game Boy. Um, you know, there, there are other strategies. I, I think that if, you're, if we're thinking about health and hospitals of the future, um, there are other modalities like acupuncture um, and sensory treatments. We're not currently outfitted to do those things. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, acupuncture is, is a very effective treatment for pain, um, no question. Um, and there are other methods, physical therapy, chiropractic care, electric stimulation, cognitive behavioral therapy. I mean, there are a variety of other tools and so it would be nice if we had for the doctors and their patients other tools. And that's something I intend to work very hard on in the next year. I look forward to hearing about that because I agree. I think that if we explored it, and I mentioned holistic medicine earlier, I think there, there's alternatives that h, h does not provide and people seek, you know, private, you know, providers and, and they go to other places and while we could really make it a, a one-stop shopping at H&H, &H, and no matter your background or your beliefs in, in medicine and prescriptions. So thank you for saying that. So I did wanna, I guess I'll ask you just a couple more questions. I know I didn't wanna make the hearing too long. Um, and I do have a number of other questions that we are not gonna get to. So what I would ask is if I can send you some of these concerns and these questions that we have and you'll have an opportunity to take your time to respond to them in depth and of course I want to underline the the transparency of course. because Dr. Katz if I showed you some of the reports that we've gotten in the past you would not find I, them acceptable. I have seen them and I I'm not here to defend them. Okay great. So uh, the primary care uh, physicians, I wanted to ask a little bit about that and the partnership that you have with some of the, um, I guess, local institutions. So you've identified the need to invigorate and expand 
primary care is one of your top priorities for the H&H &H system, which I, I completely agree with. How do you plan to address the fact that the United States, in general, the country, is gonna face a significant shortage of physicians, particularly primary care doctors in the coming years? Well, I, I appreciate your asking. One of the things that I think we underuse, and I, I wanna make a big push in health and hospitals, is for the greater use of pharmacists. Uh, people don't always appreciate that pharmacists are people who have a PhD professional level degree in pharmacology. Primary care doctors like me, we took three months of pharmacology. They study it for four years. Uh, pharmacists cannot diagnose. So when I'm in primary care, I would be the person who would say, uh, you have diabetes, you have hypertension, you have elevated cholesterol. But a system can then create what are called pharmacist physician treatment plans that say, and we had these in Los Angeles with tremendous success. Uh, so you, you may know that uh, Los Angeles is probably center one of the epidemic of diabetes because it's much higher in Latinos of Mexican descent. So a very common patient in my East LA clinic would walk in with a blood glucose of 500, which is like five times normal, and they were actually feeling okay. Maybe they were feeling a little weak and didn't know why. So there is an established protocol of how you would, what the next medical treatments are. And it takes to get someone with, with diabetes that high into control is about six or seven visits. But they don't need to see me. I've already diagnosed the condition. They have diabetes, right? They need a set of medication um, increases, and the people who are best set to do those are pharmacists. Um, they also need nurse education. They need a nutritionist. Um, but we, the, so part of the, the solution is to really look differently at your workforce. And I feel the same about uh, community health workers. Right, uh, doctors like me should not be trying to teach middle-aged people how to cook healthier food. Right, I can only microwave. Right, I, you wouldn't want nobody would want to eat the dinner that I would prepare. Right, why why does the world expect me to coach a diabetic on you know how she should cook her family's meal? Right, you should get a woman who's a diabetic who's figured out how to how to cook her family's meal to teach you know, others on how to do it. Um, and we have little pockets of this in health and hospitals. But I, I, my whole thing is anybody can do a demonstration project. I'm interested in scale. That's what I love about big systems like New York, right? I, w I don't want a cooking class in one hospital, in one clinic. I want to know that everybody who has diabetes learns how to prepare food in a healthy way for them and their family, everyone. That's how it's supposed to be, right? So I think that we can get beyond the shortage of primary care doctors if we ask doctors to do doctoring and we ask nurse to do nursing, we ask pharmacists to take care of the medications. And I think we'll actually get, and I'd add social workers, to take care of the eligibility that people need to get on uh, the appropriate uh, SNAP program to get the, the income worked income credit, right, because economics affects people's health. So as, as you would say, it requires a holistic care, and holistic care is best delivered by a team, not all by one doctor. I should add those visits are all reimbursable under insurance, right, so I'm not, I'm, I, right, I, this is a viable plan. I'll see that patient, I'll tell that patient, uh, I'll see you back if you have any new symptoms, but your next four or five visits are going to be with the pharmacist and the nurse educator and the nutritionist, and I'll be following your, your progress. I made a note here to send you a Cooking Basics book. It would be hope, hopeless. Okay, all right. So how is the, are you in partnership or, or I guess, contract with local medical schools to bring PCPs in, into the system, to bring primary care doctors, I should say, into the system? We are. Uh, we have with NYU, uh, Mount Sinai, and also the affiliate PAGNI, 
and we hire ourselves. So um, I think that uh, it's hiring itself is something that health and hospitals could do a better job. We run amazing clinics. If you were a doctor, how would you know that? Right, we, we have, uh, what I've discovered is almost nothing that would enable you to know that there is a Roberto Clemente clinic and why, why you would want to work there. I mean, community clinics are very special places, but all, all the, the job offers, they just go on some uniform website. That's not how doctors choose where to work. Uh, doctors, nurse practitioners, they choose to work because they have some connection to a community. Someone has explained, you know, why this community is so important. That hasn't been part of the, the fabric here, and that, that has to change. That's how you, how you recruit doctors. So I will ask that you consider CUNY, and it's a public system. These are people who do a lot of commuting, who are from New York City, and you know what, what I've seen a lot in, in this administration is, is, is talent coming from other places. And, and you returned home, so you, you get a pass. I get a pass. I'm um, a Brooklyn boy. Exactly. But um, what I'd love to see is us hiring from the New York City pool of talent that is so clearly here and present. So I just want to encourage you to look at CUNY and, and other local institutions. And I know that you've mentioned NYU and Mount Sinai, but well, we have some great public systems. Um, and I'd love for that partnership to, Terrific. to develop. Thank you. So before we go to the, um, to the, I guess we have a few people here to speak. And I encourage you, if you'd like to give testimony, please fill out a slip with, at the back with the sergeant at arms. I just wanted to underline, I wanted, of course, thank you all for your testimony today. I know that I'm going to see you again in a couple of months and at various topics throughout the year. Just know that this committee is not just focused on H&H &H and the public system. We are also focusing on the voluntary hospitals and their responsibility and their commitment to the city. We know that un unfortunately there is a, a burden that is on H&H &H to serve the underinsured, the uninsured, the undocumented, and everyone else that a lot of these private facilities unfortunately have a reputation for not accepting. Having said that, we want to be a partner, we want to work with you, and we ask that the same responsibility and, and, and what people ask of me in terms of transparency, accountability that you all practice. I'm, I'm feeling good about new leadership in both these positions and that we'll grow and develop together. I will ask um, in a good faith effort for you all in terms of our, our new relationship and, and the increased uh, communication um, that we ask that if you could in terms of some of the reports that you've provided in the past, whether you could give me a quick status update on a couple of reports. One of them is accrual-based and cash-based financial plans. Of course, the more detailed budgets we'd love to see, for example, budget lines for district funding and consulting fees, uh, more comprehensive correctional health services reports, and of course, an updated transformation plan that takes into account your new vision and your conversations with all the stakeholders that are even just in this room. So we'd love to see that um, as soon as possible so we can prepare to have a more robust conversation and to not keep circling on some of the things that, that we've mentioned in the past two hearings. And just wanted to ask maybe a quick, what has your team done so far on some of these reports in terms of where you are and whether we can have some of that information? And when do you think? Um. So on the accrual-based budgeting, it is, it is an issue that has plagued health and hospitals for a long time. It is um, the, the lack of a viable um, financial system has not allowed us to build something along those lines, but now with our ERP system, we are getting closer to that. The accrual budgets that we put out to date are estimates based on our cash system, and, and that is available today, but it doesn't necessarily provide you any more information than what you have in the cash system, and, and clearly living dollar to dollar allows us to sort of focus more on cash for operating expenditures. Um, as we get to a more stable place, I think we can get to an accrual budget that will be more meaningful, um, so we can work towards that. I don't think there is anything that is keeping us from doing that. We can work with the council staff, and I, I've worked with them for a long time to know what their hopes are, and, and, and we can do that. Um. 
So. Okay, and so the, the detailed budgets, including the consulting fees, budget lines for disrupt funding, I just wanna make sure that you have all that written down. Um, and comprehensive, the CHS reports, really making sure that we're um, communicating, and, and I plan to have a joint hearing with the Criminal Justice Committee, but I'd love that information well beforehand. Sorry, go ahead. Oh. And then finally, of course, the updated transformation plan. I know we're two and a half months in, so I know that there's a lot of work to do, and I really want to consider you all a partner going forward. And again, anything you need from us, we'll, we'll try to reciprocate. Well, thank, thank you, you so you. much. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. And safe travels. Thank you. I'm sorry I'm going to miss you at the Bellevue Legislative Breakfast. Me too. I'll Next. let them know I was born there. Next soon breakfast. Soon. breakfast. Thank you everyone who is here, who has uh, stayed with us. I know that not only do we have a delayed start, um, you have waited patiently. So I'm gonna call up the first uh, panel. Yeah, let's time them. Two minutes. Let's give them three minutes, huh? Three, 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 three minutes. I'm going to call up Erica Lessam from TAG, Claudia Calhoun from NYIC, and Andrea Bowen. And thanks again for your patience. Thank you for being here. So we're, we have a, a clock just to your right of time. If there's anything, I don't want to stop you in the middle of your thought. Just, you know, complete your sentence, your thought, and, and let's work together. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chair, and to all the um, health committee, uh, hospital committee members for your commitment to making New York a healthier, more equitable place, and for the opportunity to call your attention to the growing threat of tuberculosis in New York City. My name is Erica Lessam, and I'm from Treatment Action Group. Treatment Action Group is an independent, activist, community-based research and policy think tank fighting for better treatment for HIV and related conditions like TB. We at TAG and our partners are alarmed by TB's recent rise in New York City. T TB is airborne and infectious, meaning anyone who breathes is at risk of contracting this potentially deadly disease. But TB disproportionately affects the most vulnerable, those with weak immune systems, people living in crowded settings, and our immigrant communities. Despite being preventable and curable, TB is on the rise in New York City for the first time in over 25 years. This resurgence of TB is a direct result of years of underinvestment in New York City's TB response. While in recent years the city, thanks in part to your leadership, has steadily funded TB, a history of cuts since 2007 have reduced the city's TB funding by half. Several of the city's TB clinics have closed, and the few that are still open have much more limited hours and staffing. This failure to adequately fund TB places a large burden on New York City hospitals, in addition to causing preventable suffering and inequities. The majority of TB cases in New York City are first identified in hospitals. This means that we're failing to prevent TB and find it earlier in our communities, and to treat it before people become very sick and require hospitalization. It also means that when people do have symptoms, they're not going to New York City Health Department chest clinics. This is in part because so few chest clinics remain. Once people are in hospitals, those who are infection, uh, infectious must be placed in expensive isolation wards to keep the disease from spreading. Over half of New Yorkers with TB are uninsured, which places an even greater financial burden on hospitals. People who are hospitalized for TB also require evaluations upon diagnosis and prior to discharge to review their charts, assess if their home environment is safe to return to, and identify contacts needing evaluation for TB. But public health advisors um, staffing have been cut, which places further burdens on hospitals, meaning patients have to stay there longer until they can be appropriately assessed and released. Investing in the public health response to TB now will save billions and alleviate a huge burden on New York City's hospitals. 
adequate funding would allow for active outreach by community organizations to prevent people from entering hospitals with TB in the first place, and it would allow people to leave hospitals sooner who have TB, and for them to seek care in chest clinics where they should be getting treatment instead of in our hospitals. These efforts could save the city billions of dollars, Similar to what we've been seeing lately, budget cuts in the 70s and 80s dismantled the public health response to TB and led to a massive outbreak of drug-resistant TB in New York City that cost over $1 billion to control. We're in danger of repeating history, and we ask for your support to restore New York City's funding to the um, health department's TB efforts and save hospitals money. Um, we're asking for $15 million in funding for TB, a $6.3 million increase over the current year. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Claudia Calhoun. I'm the Director of Health Policy at the New York Immigration Coalition. Um, I'd like to start by thanking uh, Chairwoman Carlina Rivera for your long track record of work on health equity. We're very excited about the creation of this committee and we're very excited to work with you on public and voluntary hospitals and how they serve immigrant communities. Uh, we are an advocacy and policy umbrella organization for more than 200 members across the state and we work closely with h, &H on extending health care to immigrant communities h and is what I really want to talk about today. Um, the letter last year right after the election, the open letter to immigrants was a really uh, important um, vehicle in reassuring patients about the safety in the wake of the change in the federal administration. Um, so we advocate to h, h we advocate on behalf of h, &H for resources to, to benefit immigrant communities and we advocate to h, &H for ways that they can um, improve the services that immigrants receive. And uh, listening to um, President Katz's um, uh, testimony was, is very heartening because it's obvious that, and, and, and listening to the questions that are asked here, it's very, there's a, a lot of people that are concerned about the same issues we're thinking of. Um, one of the things in the testimony that we submitted is a memo that we wrote based on some focus groups that we did in uh, three different neighborhoods among Korean speakers in Flushing right at the end of 2016, Spanish speakers on Staten Island, and French-speaking West Africans in East Harlem in the Bronx. Uh, even though these are very diverse communities uh, in distinct parts of the city, there were a bunch of uh, numerous cross-cutting themes that emerged about the, the affordability of services, even sometimes when there's a fee scale, lack of courtesy and a welcoming attitude, and of course cultural competence and humility, persistence of barriers in terms of language access, waiting times, the difficulty of making appointments by phone, and the importance of access to primary special and behavioral health care. And, and I think it's important to note that immigrant communities do understand, they do understand that it's better to go see a primary care doctor generally in our experience and, and that going to the emergency room is not the desirable sort of way to get services. So some time has passed since we convened these groups, but um, we know from our member organizations that many of these issues persist. Um, the other thing is that it, NYSC was a participant in h, &H evaluation of its h, &H, h h options program, which was also at the end of 2016, and that evaluation also turned up um, really persistent concerns about language access, reducing the stigma of being uninsured, and addressing the, what, what patients experienced, experienced as a, a, a stigma associated with being an immigrant when they seek healthcare services, which is really troubling. So the thing I want to talk about today sort of is very responsive to all of those challenges, which is the Action Health NYC pilot. Um, one important, this was a program that h, &H undertook in cooperation with, with a, lot of, a lot of other partners to address many of the challenges. Uh, it's, it was a demonstration project that came out of the Immigrant Health Task Force. We would love, I've got a extensive comments on it in my written testimony, but we would love to see it scaled up Currently, we don't know of plans to look, there was a very rigorous evaluation that was done and we don't know of plans to sort of formally take those learnings and incorporate them, incorporate them into care across the system. Although, of course, um, the comments that were made today are very, especially about scaling up and, 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 and not focusing on pilots were very heartening. And so we're really eager to work with the council and with h, &H on ways to do that. Good afternoon, Chair Rivera and uh, council staff, or our committee staff. Um, my name is Andrea Bowen, <laughs> and I'm a consultant working on behalf of uh, what we call the Transgender and Gender Nonconforming Solutions Coalition, 
which includes the Anti-Violence Project, Audre Lorde Project, GMHC, the LGBT Community Center, Make the Road, Sylvia Rivera Law Project, and the Trans Latina Network. Um, these organizations have been working in concert uh, since 2015 to um, get policy and budget solutions from the community and then bring that to policymakers. Um, it was basically kicked off by the LGBT Caucus of City Council and the previous speaker um, who encouraged the organizations to go into every borough and sort of figure out what people needed. Um, so the organiz organizations did that between 2016 and 2017 and we kind of um, uh, took those recommendations and we have boiled them down right now to six budget recommendations for this season. Um, we have brought these to the attention of mayoral staff and agencies. Um, and um, basically we have the entire list connected to our testimony if you wanna see it. Um, in the event that these don't end up in the executive budget, we'd like to be able to work with you in putting them in. Um, specifically the uh, proposal I wanna talk to you about today is a, uh, I can say TGNC to refer to transgender and not gender nonconforming people, a TGNC healthcare liaison program that we've pitched to both um, H and H and DOHMH. Um, it would be about uh, eight hundred twenty thousand dollars, and so the basic idea of it is this: um, even though health insurance in New York City is increasingly covering transgender healthcare needs. What we're finding from the community is there's um, sort of a lack of coordination of care. Everything from people getting insurance denials still for care that should be covered to like arranging aftercare for people after they've had certain surgeries. Um, it also has to do with just making sure you get respectful care um, for stuff that isn't necessarily TGNC related. Um, TGNC people get diabetes, they have heart problems, and they need care for all of these things. Um, uh, you know, we know through some statistical information also um, that I cite in the testimony that TGNC people compared to their non-TGNC lesbian, gay, bisexual peers are at significant disadvantages in health. So we pitched a liaison program. It would uh, provide seven liaisons to work in hospitals across the city to basically be like case managers and advocates for TGNC patients, enforce people's rights within the system, um, and make sure that every part of the care team is in communication. Again, this is an idea that came from the community and now we're trying to push it as, as a budget item. Um, in the event that this doesn't end up in the executive, uh, again, we'll be um, asking for your support and trying to make sure that this becomes a reality. And uh, thank you for your time. <clears throat> Is there any position close to this at any of the existing facilities, do you feel? So, H&H &H has an LGBTQ, um, I forgot her exact title, it's LGBTQ liaison, um, who does amazing work coordinating care, um, making sure trainings are happening, but um, for people who are kind of more like sites, we're looking for people who are more site specific, um, who can um, help people sort of traverse the medical system. I and mean, we have H&H &H in mind specifically as having people who can be in different facilities and help people with care in those facilities as opposed to stretching um, this one person in many, many, many right. different directions when she should really, she, you know, probably be looking at the entire system as a whole. Um, so this would be, yeah, specific coordinated individual care, people who help with specific coordinated individual care, which is not really a position that exists in the system to our understanding. Okay, so there's, you're saying there's pretty much one person right now who's doing this work? Uh, to my understanding, yes. Okay, yeah. okay. No, I, I mean, when you're on site and you're interacting with people, of course, it's, it's very, very different than even a phone call or, so, so thank you, thank you all so much for your testimony. Um, I want to go back to the, the tuberculosis and, and the $15 million that you're asking for, it, it would go to what exactly? Um, ideally, it would go um, to staffing back up the public health advisors who are kind of the liaisons between the hospitals and the outpatient care and enable that transition to happen. Um, it would go to community groups as well to kind of be the um, awareness raising and outreach arms on the ground. Um, we heard from a partner organization, um, African Services Committee, who signed on to our uh, appeal for funding, which is also included in the written testimony. They used to receive funding from the health department and were able to offer free TB screening and educational services and prevention services in their community 
they're no longer able to do so because the health department's capacity for funding such outreach is over now. Um, and they're having to charge for tests now, and a lot of their patients can't afford that. So people are just going without um, diagnosis, and then they wind up you know, ending up in emergency rooms because they're coughing up blood um, when we could have prevented active cases to begin with if we found them earlier. And um, Ms. Calhoun, th thank you for what you said about cultural competency, and, and I think that that's something that we all want to experience, whether it's language, whether it's your background, whether it's your community. Um, I know of the work that New York Immigration Coalition does, and it is very comprehensive. So I'm glad we all are feeling good about the plans for H&H, &H and, and of course we have a lot of work to do. So I'm looking forward to I guess reading your testimony in depth, and I, I really encourage you if you have any questions specifically for me, or of course the fabulous staff here that really keeps me going, um, please feel free to reach out. Thank you so much. Okay, and then our last panel is going to be Jerry Wesley, okay, and Ralph Palladino, and Kevin Collins. Be able to hear right from you all. Yeah. Okay, there's so that's why I'm trying to get them in. Okay. <laughs> Whenever you're ready, Mr. Collins, you'll be first. I'm okay. How are you? How's that? Better. Good I do afternoon. the same thing. I get it. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Kevin Collins, the Executive Director of Doctors Council SEIU. We represent doctors in health and hospitals and various city agencies, including the Department of Health in Rikers Island. H&H uh, &H takes care of all New Yorkers and historically it takes care of the city's poorest and sickest patients. It remains the city's largest provider of health care to Medicaid patients and faces, of course, current financial challenges. As we embark on this period of history, we're aware of what we wrote in a white paper that we presented to the city and H&H &H a while back. There is continued pressures, of course, to cut costs. Even as the ACA expanded the number of patients who have health insurance, H&H &H still takes care of a large number of patients who do not have health insurance, especially undocumented immigrants. Rather than be fearful and reactive to this daunting reality, we have an ethical responsibility to embrace this challenge. Cutting services, consolidations, or closing hospitals is not the answer. Privatization or outsourcing is not a solution. These are misguided attempts at the challenges facing us and abdicating our collective mission to provide quality and affordable care to all New Yorkers. Dr. Donald Berwick, who's a former administrator of CMS, reminds us there is a choice to be made. As he says, quote, chop or improve. If we permit chopping, I assure you that the chopping block will get very full, first with the cuts to the most vo voiceless and poorest amongst us, but soon thereafter to more and more of us. Fewer health insurance benefits, declining access, more out-of-pocket burdens, growing delays. If we don't improve, the cynics win. Doctors, Council, SEIU professional members, and our leaders will work with H&H &H and its new CEO, Dr. Katz, and take a strong leadership role to improve our current delivery system. We support the focus on clinical positions and agree that H&H &H can grow itself out of the budget situation by working together. We don't have to shrink to succeed. Doctors are enthusiastic about working together for the good of our patients. We are pleased that H&H &H has plans to hire additional physicians so there is more availability and shorter wait times. Patients want our services and we need to have the staff to be able to see them. We agree that, with Dr. Katz that we need to invigorate and expand primary care, improve access to specialty care, and implement plans to improve H&H's fiscal situation. Specifically, we support focusing on clinical positions instead of outside consultants in order to reduce administrative expenses. We believe that the system can successfully provide quality specialized care that meets patients' critical needs while producing revenue. Importantly, H&H &H would greatly benefit from recovering more revenue by improving billing and coding practices, and we look forward to working together on that. In closing, we, we know that we have to be thinking outside the box 
in terms of trying to attract more patients into the system. We suggest looking at a pilot program between the Department of Mental Health um, and a, a high needs community. Maybe we could run a, a, a project between the school and H&H &H facility. Um, we support a number of the increases in the CHS budget. Um, and we are always cognizant, of course, of the convergence of two factors, the dish funding coming from uh, Albany and the state indigent care pool uh, formula that we think really needs to get fixed so H&H &H and other safety net facilities throughout the state can get the money that they do for the patient population that together we see. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Good day. I'm Ralph Palladino, second vice president of Local 1549, District Council 37, representing 5,000 employees of the public health system, um, uh, New York City Health and Hospitals. Um, our members perform financial and revenue raising duties in H&H. Uh, &H. I am an employee and a patient at Bellevue Hospital. I choose to be a patient at Bellevue Hospital. I could be a patient any place else in the city but I choose to be at Bellevue because Bellevue saved my life and has improved my health. I don't want to get into the details. I'm abridging this, as you can tell. Um, the problems that at H&H &H stem around the issues around access. There are two kinds of access. One access is primary care doctors, clinics, et cetera. There's no reason why I should be waiting four months for primary care appointment, sorry. I've been waiting six months in the past. It's down to four. Um, Metro Plus signing up, our members represent, uh, we represent Metro Plus signing up people for health care. They're waiting on the average three months for primary care doctor for their first visit. And that's why a lot of people who sign up for Metro Plus do not stay in the system. There's a severe problem with access. The second part of access is street access. Try calling some of the hospitals and getting through to speak to someone on the phone. Try calling to a clinic and try to speak to someone in the clinic if you don't have a direct number. Call centers, things have improved some, I have to say, in the last year. But call centers also are, are hard to get through to, although they're better than they were. Much more has to be done with that kind of access. We represent a lot of the people in communications and the call center areas. So that people will walk with their, with their feet if they're not able to get through on the phone and be able to make their appointments. Uh, we're going right to the local 1549 ask to the city council. First, to actively engage the governor and state legislature to ensure democratic decision making and fairness for the public institutions in receiving the funding they should be receiving. The New York State legislators should also have a say in who receives this emergency fund and the methodology for payment. NYC H and H should receive their fair share based on the proportion of Medicaid and indigenous patients, indigenous patients that we care for. We don't now, we know this. There was a proposal to up it to $1.5 billion from one. We have no problem with upping it for $1.5 billion, but we do have a problem if the money is used as it was for the Blue Cross Blue Shield fiasco in the late uh, 1990s, okay? The money must go to patient care and it must be fairly done and, and sent to where the patients, the, the money should follow the patients. Uninsured and Medicaid dollars need to be sent to those institutions. To actively engage the governor and state legislature to increase the reimbursement rates for Medicaid, not raised in 10 years. And in California, my understanding is, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Katz, that the co cost of care, it's a law, that the Medicaid reimbursement has to, re make the cost of care. Um, to increase the tax levy funding in New York from in the city. Currently, 25% of H&H's budget is tax levy money. This is, Mayor de Blasio needs to be congratulated for upping it. When, when Rudy Giuliani was the mayor, it was down to practically nothing. Uh, however, under the Dinkins administration, in, in the book, uh, no one was turned away by Senator Opdyke. It's documented the city was up to 33% of H&H's budget. So more could be done by the city. We also encourage the uh, use of seeking 1115 waivers uh, from the federal government because this administration, as bad as it is in Washington, is believing in states' rights 
our, our discussions with people in CMS and others uh, all say that they are open to states doing things, and we sh that should be looked into. Um, to insist that New York City Health and Hospitals stop wasting tax dollars paying higher paid titles that they were not hired for and cease circumventing the civil service system as currently is going on in the institution. The document documentation I attached is only the tip of the iceberg. It's not the total numbers, by the way. It, th those numbers equal a million dollars. Multiply that by the year. There's more coming. To cease the continuing hiring of private temporary workers to fill positions, especially for clerical administrative duties. If our work is unimportant, why do they have temps being hired today, in the last couple of weeks, going to, to sessions for hiring? If our work is so unimportant, why? And it's a quality of care issue. Last thing, thank you very much for indulging me, to encourage the New York City Health and Hospitals to, in a genuine give and take partnership, with labor, with community advisory boards, of which I was a member at one time, and health and other parts of the advocacy community in redesigning the work in the entire system, the health delivery system. We don't need another Deloitte. We don't need another um, <coughs> consultants who re just recently took work away from our members who were doing it for like 30 years and gave it to a higher title. And they all had the consultant sit next to the person, not asking them questions. And that doesn't work. That, that stuff doesn't work. So thank you very much. Again, I'm sorry to have run over. Thank you, thank you. That's okay, that's okay. Local 1549, you know, is very special to me. <laughs> My mother's union. <doing. laughs> sorry. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. I am Jerry Wesley, healthcare transformation futurist at Satisfactology Business Systems. We specialize in satisfying customer care outcomes and healthifying workforce engagement and restoring organizational fiscal health. Uh, we're, Satisfactology is also one of the nation's first patient satisfaction science of its kind. As a former senior management consultant of New York City Health and Hospital Corporation, I know firsthand that the workforce engagement and workforce development is drastically lacking in preparing the workforce for the changing healthcare landscape, including social determinants of health. When I say no one has adequately prepared the workforce, I mean civil service, union leadership, city and state, leadership for, for the city and state executives, hospital executive leadership, nor the workers themselves, neither the universities, non-traditional non -traditional, uh, training. No one has adequately prepared our workforce. And as a result, they're kind of stuck. So ACA, Hospital of Care, ACA, HCAPs, PCMH, and value-based payment models, they are all like apps that have been downloaded onto the healthcare industry's desktop with no cultural operating system to run them. So as a result, hospitals, including NYC h and &H, is struggling with the workforce that is unprepared. So with no cultural operating system to run them, one of the things that we would like to do is engage New York Central Health and Hospital Corporation and shift into what we call in terms of thinking operational, cultural operational thinking systems, where we can begin to prepare our workforce to be able to optimize value-based care experiences, outcomes, and payment models. We're also interested in engaging New York City Health and Hospital Corporation in a $500 million cost reduction journey towards healthifying organizational fiscal health. We have over $87 million spent <coughs> on malpractice costs, absenteeism costs, and these are projections, in terms of health risk factors, $67 million. CMS denials, HCAPs, readmissions, 
HAIs, and a disengaged workforce, over, 40, for over $476 million. So there is definitely, and obviously, money and cost savings to be had. We just need a cultural operating system process to bring that about. Thank you. Mr. Wesley, uh, you're from Satis Satisfactology Business Systems? Right, I am from Satisfactology Business Systems, but we also have a 501c3, uh, Get Healthier Care Together, uh, that we operate out of Brooklyn. And we're interested in working with the city to uh, uh, retrofit New York City Health and Hospital Corporation workforce. And we'll be more than happy to submit a proposal in terms of how we can uh, do that in the most cost-effective way. And Get Healthy Care is based in Brooklyn? Yes, it's a 501c get, uh, and, and the reason why we set, set up our operations there, even though we're at One World Trade Center, one of the executives said, well, how can we talk about uh, transforming health outcomes 85 stories high? So we've created, set up a presence in Brooklyn because Brooklyn is home to the second worst health outcomes uh, in the state. The Bronx is the worst. So uh, this is a serious challenge for us, for our healthcare system. Of the 34 one-star hospitals in New York State, eight of them is in Brooklyn. And most of New York City Health and Hospital <coughs> hospitals are one-star facilities. Now, uh, there are, the challenge is definitely there for us to bring this about. And one of the biggest issues is addressing the workforce. And I know it's a very sensitive topic, because they're not only in, uh, New York City employees, they're also, they also represent very powerful unions who are a voting bloc that select the mayor and, and city council. However, we have already had a chance when I worked with New York City Health and Hospital Corporation before do a, a pilot some of the ideas that we're talking about now at Queens Hospital C uh, Center. This was uh, many years ago but we engaged the workforce, created a very healthy environment, brought in the unions, they supported the uh, idea. This was the, the HCAPS dry run exercise back in 206, 207, and Queens <coughs> Hospital, which was one of the hospitals that, may, that the former mayor Giuliani wanted to close, end up having the highest uh, scores in the corporation. All, the, all of this information I'm telling you, you can check. It was reported by uh, Mr. Vilas in his uh, end of the year report to the board of directors. So we know how to bring this about. We know how to make it happen. But what is required is the will. And so we have a union friendly model that we use called Charmstar, which, uh, which was very effective in bringing about the top patient satisfaction scores during the dry run, as well as reducing malpractice costs. We reduced over a two year period, over a $20 million malpractice cost reduction at Elmhurst Hospital. This information is also available from the New York City Comptroller's Office. So you can validate everything I'm telling you. Well, thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Mr. Palladino. Um, I know you mentioned waiting four months for an appointment. And I think uh, Dr. Katz was very intentional in saying that he is going to continue to work on the scheduling system, also customer service. He even mentioned picking up that phone that you mentioned that never got answered when you called. Um, My apologies. I was over in Do It across the street. We got moved, so I didn't hear. Well, we'll you know, we all Sorry. have to work with the local ecosystem here. And, and Kevin, of course, thank you for your focus on clinical positions. I think that was also made clear in the, in the doctor's testimony. So I just want to thank you all for your testimony today, for waiting, for your patience, of course, and, and for attending this hearing. Uh, are there any other members of the public that wish to testify today? Seeing none, uh, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you.